Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you each for participating in the Virginia Department of Health Project ECHO COVID-19 Tele-ECHO Clinic. Next slide, please. Quick disclaimer, VDH is rapidly working to develop resources to address COVID-19. Guidance does change and all participants are encouraged to continue their own research. If you have a question, please email IVP at vdh.virginia.gov and we'll have a timely follow-up response. Next slide. This session does count toward continuing education credits. VNA approved one hour CNE and Karelian's Clinic CME program designates this as one AMA PRA category one credit. All speakers have no conflict of interest to disclose, and following the recession, VDH will post the didactic links and information with the evaluation link and instructions for receiving credit on the VDH Product Echo website. Closed captioning is offered for the session. Next slide. Some helpful tips. This Tele-Echo Clinic is for educational purposes. By participating, you are consenting to being recorded, and recordings will be available on projectechoesbox.com, protected by a password. Clinicians can view the recording later and materials will be shared with the Project Echo community. Please mute yourself for not speaking and please do not share any information that can identify or can be used to identify a patient's identity. Next slide. Our facilitator today is Dr. Greasy Williams. Dr. Greasy Williams is a board certified pediatrician with experience working in pediatric emergency rooms and urgent cares, as well as six years with the CDC in their Center for Preparedness and Response. Dr. Greasy Williams is currently working with PDH to help with the COVID-19 effort. Our clinical consultant today is Dr. Colin Wozencraft, trained in internal medicine palliative in Richmond, Virginia, before practicing and teaching nationally and internationally, focusing on implementing palliative medicine in developing regions. Our VDH consultants today are Diane Woolard and Carol Jamerson. Diane Woolard is the former director of VDH's Division of Surveillance and Investigation, working with VDH on COVID-19 response. And Carol Jamerson is a nurse epidemiologist with VDH's Healthcare Associated Infections and Antimicrobial Resistance Program with 25 years of experience in board certification. We have three speakers today. Our first is Lauren Yerkes. Uh, she is our own injury and violence prevention program epidemiologist with the Virginia Department of Health, and we're thankful she's here to join us. Our second speaker is Dr. Jim May. Dr. May is the Chief Operating Officer, Lead of Planning, Development, Research, and Evaluation for the Substance Use Disorder Services with the Richmond Behavioral Health Authority, with over three, de three decades of experience, whom I'm excited to hear from today. And our case presenter is Dr. Kathleen Decker. Dr. Decker is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association with the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps, who will uh, be joining our effort to respond to COVID-19. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Chrissy Williams. Thank you, Hector. If we could move to the next slide, please. Perfect. So as always, I'll just start with a very brief review of the number of cases in Virginia, as well as reviewing our epidemic curve. And so on this slide, you can see that as of yesterday, we have 59,514 total cases with 1,661 deaths. Um, the hotspots tend to remain the same, probably because of population size with Northern Virginia, the Richmond metro area, um, and kind of the Eastern Tidewater area, showing the most number of cases. Next slide, please. And our epidemic curve reveals that we are continuing to trend downward. Um, and the horizontal axis represents the number of cases by date of symptom onset, with the yellow line representing a seven-day moving average. Um, illness may not have been reported yet for data for the past 14 days, so it's not complete quite yet, but it does appear that we are continuing our downward trend. Next slide, please. So today's clinic topics um, are centered around mental health, and I think we're going to have a great uh, session today. We'll start off with uh, Lauren Yerkes presenting information on injury and violence data during the COVID-19 pandemic in Virginia, letting us know what trends are going on and um, how that's been impacted. And then Dr. May will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on frontline responders, um, re reviewing stress, depression, opioid use, mental health disorders, and resilience. And then Dr. Decker will present some case scenarios in mental health, including how to assess mental health disorders over telehealth platforms. Next slide, please. So we'll start with Lauren Yerkes with her information on injury and violence data during COVID-19. So if we could switch to her slide set and then I will turn it over to you, Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having me today. Again, my name is Lauren Yerkes, and I am the Injury and Violence Prevention Epidemiologist within the Division of Population Health Data and the Office of Family Health Services at the Virginia Department of Health. Next slide, please. 
Today we are going to talk about injury and violence data during COVID-19. We'll first talk a little bit about a global glimpse at what injury and violence data is looking like during the pandemic. And then we will go and dive a little bit deeper into Virginia data. So we'll have some information on domestic violence hotline and suicide prevention lifeline data. And then we'll focus a little bit on injury and violence related emergency department visits as these data are received in near real time. And then finally, we'll take a very quick glance into injury and violence related hospitalizations and deaths in Virginia. And I will say in advance is that currently, we'll talk a little bit about it later, but we don't have any data due to delay for hospitalizations. Next slide, please. So it's really important to kind of set the tone and the foundation of looking at data in our state by also taking a look at what the intersection of injury and violence during COVID-19 looks like on a global scale. So after the stay at home orders or the country's lockdowns, a lot of injury and violence data started to come on board about what the epidemic of injury and violence is looking like. And concerningly, what we see around the globe is that domestic and intimate partner violence are increasing. There are several reports now from many different countries about domestic and intimate partner violence. A recent report from the United Nations Women focused on Palestinian women said that there were Palestine were experiencing increased physical violence complaints to hotlines. And in one week from April 9th to the 16th, Palestine saw a 10% increase of female calls on domestic violence and abuse in of a week. We're also seeing increases in Latin American such as Argentina. Argentina saw a 67% rise in calls from domestic abuse in April versus a year earlier. Chile also saw a 70% rise in the first weekend in quarantine. But interestingly, formal reports of domestic violence actually declined 40%. So some countries are seeing increases in their actual hotline calls, but decreases in formal reports. China also saw a 30% increase in domestic violence reports and a surge in calls since early February when the government first locked down cities in the main province. And we're also seeing increases in Spain, 18% um, in Spain in the first two weeks of lockdown for increases in domestic violence calls. Here in the country of the US, so the United States, domestic violence calls went up 11% since the beginning of quarantine. So all over the country, the country and the world were seeing increases in domestic and intimate partner violence calls. Additionally, there is a, an increased risk of family violence, and we see that not just with COVID-19, but it's also well studied about family violence increasing in aftermath of natural disasters. So an article recently came out about the risk of family violence due to the pandemic, especially due to risk factors such as unemployment, reduced income, limited resources, and social support. And it also made a very important note that several other of these journal articles said as well as reports of increasing gun and ammunition sales in the U.S. during the crisis. And there is a very clear link between firearm access and fatal domestic violence incidents. In for in terms of firearm violence, there are concerns about firearm violence during COVID-19. There was a recent report in Philadelphia that they looked at the past five years of the month of March. And March of 2020 was the worst month in five years for firearm violence. In Philadelphia, there were 141 shootings in March of 2020. And within the first 10 days of Philadelphia stay at home order, there were 52 shooting victims in the city. This also talked about surge in gun sales in, um, as being one of the risk factors for firearm violence. 
in March of 2020, there was 1 million more background checks for uh, gun sales that were performed versus March of 2019. So that's an increase of 91%. Also, not just domestic and intimate partner violence, but also drug or alcohol misuse and suicide. A recent report that was done by the Wellbeing Trust um, estimated about 75,000 deaths of despair in the United States. So deaths of despair are deaths due to drug, alcohol, and suicide. And they used the Great Recession as the baseline to conduct these estimates. And their algorithm was based on unemployment impact. And Virginia was found to have medium level rates or a crude rate of between 15.75 to 19.44 per 100,000 people for estimated additional deaths from 2020, expected for 2020 through 2029 of deaths of despair due to COVID-19 pandemic. We're also seeing reports of opioid-related overdose increases during COVID-19, and we'll look at that in our emergency department visits a little bit later. And then finally, suicide rates are certainly a concern due to several risk factors intensified by COVID-19, including risk factors like economic stress, social isolation, um, decreased access to community and religious support, also barriers to mental health treatment, illness, and medical problems. And then as well, they also cited firearm sales. And then there are seasonal variation in rates of suicide. Uh, suicide rates actually increase during early spring normally. And so out in a COVID-19 pandemic, that's also anticipated as a risk factor as well. Next slide, please. So now that we have a little bit of detail about what injury and violence looks like on a global scale, we'll focus a little bit on Virginia. And there are several data sources that we can look at to understand more about injury and violence during COVID-19 in our state. The first thing that I want to highlight is our domestic violence hotline calls in Virginia. So this is a really rich data source to understand more about what domestic violence and intimate partner violence is looking like within our state. There are two data sources that we'll focus on today. One is called VA data or VA data, which includes all hotline records that are received, including other hotlines such as the Prison Rape Elimination Act or PREA and the LGBTQ plus helpline calls. So th those are all hotline records throughout our state. And then a separate one is the Action Alliance Services, which is essentially a subset of VA data, and it's data exclusive to when Action Alliance is the primary agency of those hotline calls. So I wanted to make those notes that we really have two data sources for this. When we're looking at VA data of March through June of 2019, compared to March through June of 2020, we see some interesting notes. So overall, for all of the hotline records, there was a 27% decrease in the number of phone calls from 2019 to 2020 during that same time period. However, there was an 84% increase, increase in emails and a 360% increase in texts or chats. So Overall, there were 12,787 phone calls in VA data, 651 emails, and 934 texts or chats. But the important thing to note about this is that there is still considered data entry delay because this is near real-time data. Data is continually coming in. Also, there were staff shifts due to COVID-19, so some staff or personnel are having to do other things for COVID-19. And then also, the increases in emails and texts and chats might be partially due to local agencies launching the chat and text services in 2019 
and then also adding additional online platforms as we go more virtual in our assistance to folks. But then when we look at Action Alliance of March 2019, that month, compared to March 2020, there's a little bit of a difference. So in total, there was a 73% increase in calls. So again, this is a subset and a 16% increase in forwarded hours. So overall, there were 4,959 program calls to Action Alliance services in March of 2020. And we also note is that the highest call volume is seen in the daytime hours between 8 and 4 p.m. There is a bump in the evening from 6 to 9 p.m. And the demographics look similar from March through June of 2019 to March through June of 2020. Um, the volume is primarily cisgender women um, ages 25 through 49 years of age. Um, in the eastern or central region of the state, and the majority describe an incident of violence before 18 years of age. Next slide, please. So I also wanna draw your attention to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline calls. Um, there are also two data sources for this. Um, one is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is four centers. Um, in our state and provides overall and county level number of calls to the Virginia Department of Health. And then we have a capacity grant data source, which is more detailed data and three out of four National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Centers participate in these capacity grant data. But the capacity grant data does not include Spanish speaking or veteran routed calls. So in the main National Suicide Prevention Lifelines, that's all four centers that take suicide prevention lifeline calls, the number of calls in 2020 aligns similarly with 2017. And as you can see to the chart on the left-hand side, there is a decreasing trend from 2018 to 2020. Of course, we'll continue to monitor this, um, but this is what the data looks like now. There were 13,234 calls to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline from March through May of 2020. But when we look at the capacity grant data, there is no real overall increase in the number of received or answered calls from December 2019 to May 2020. So when you look at it monthly um, from those several months, there's really no difference in the number of calls. However, there were notable increases in the number of calls among females. So if you look at December 2019 calls, to May 2020 calls, there's a 25% increase among females, a 571% increase among persons aged 12 and under, and 110% increase in 13 to 24 years of age. Also, there were increases that were notable um, from December 2019 to May 2020 specifically related to financial or basic needs. So there were 17 calls related to financial and basic needs in December of 2019 and 83 in May of 2020. So a 388% increase. Job loss was also very considerable in the amount of calls that were received in May 2020 compared to December 2019. And finally, there was a 117% increase in calls related to abuse and victimization. Next slide, please. After we look at the call data, I want to talk a little bit about injury and violence related emergency department visits during the COVID-19 pandemic. These data come from Essence, which is our syndromic surveillance data system and is based on chief complaint data. So that's essentially the initial reason or the primary reason why the person entered the emergency department. Overall, emergency department visits went down 42% nationwide during the stay at home orders. This is from a CDC uh, morbidity and mortality report that was recently published. 
And we're also seeing that in Virginia. There is a large decrease in emergency department utilization overall statewide, a 50% decrease by the last week of March when compared to early months of 2020. Although in recent weeks, visit volume is starting to creep up again, as you can see on the right top chart, um, it's still well below pre-COVID-19 levels. So there's a large drop in March 2020 and a small steady increase now. Rates of emergency department visits. So we heard a little bit earlier about the global look and the national look of opioid overdoses. We're also seeing that in Virginia. So even though emergency department utilization is down, the rates of emergency department visits due to opioid overdoses have increased since March of 2020, especially in heroin overdose visits that spiked in late April and stayed elevated into May. And that is the lower right-hand chart that you can see there. There were no increases in the percentage of self-harm or intimate partner violence emergency department visits in Virginia. So those have stayed relatively level. Um, but it is important to note that we are unable to tell yet if these trends are really genuine due to the decreased emergency department utilization and the current healthcare seeking behavior in Virginians. Next slide, please. So as we talked earlier about in the outline, unfortunately, the data are very delayed for hospitalization discharge data. So we don't know yet um, what injury and violence related hospitalizations look like during the COVID-19 pandemic, but we are looking forward to receiving those data to see and monitor what that looks like. But I did want to bring your attention to some death certificate data from the Office of Vital Records that we receive. 2019 and 2020 death data are considered provisional and subject to change. So there is still a delay in death certificate data. Those data, when a person is deceased, those data are looked at at the National Center for Health Statistics and then confirmed and reported back to the Virginia Department of Health. So there can be up to a nine month delay on death certificate data, but we do look at these data on a weekly basis. From March 1st to May 31st of the past three years is what we're looking at today um, for deaths by suicide, deaths by firearm, overdose deaths and deaths by homicide. And as you can see for all four categories, in 2020, March 1st through May 31st, there were decreases. Now, what we don't know quite yet is we anticipate receiving more information on death certificate data moving forward. So even though these look like lower numbers, we anticipate receiving more information and therefore cannot tell as of yet whether that is a true decrease or whether that is just due to data delay. But I did think that it was important to show you all today what our numbers are looking like for the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So really final points on injury and violence prevention during the COVID-19 pandemic. It is evident that injuries and violence are of serious public health concern worldwide, not just right now during the results of the COVID-19 pandemic, but at all times. Um, but data do show initial varying trends in injury and violence. And so it's still considered provisional and more time is needed to understand what injury and violence landscape really looks like uh, statewide, nationwide, and worldwide. So the most important thing right now is to continue monitoring of available data sources. So we are looking at hotline call, emergency department, hospitalization and death data. But combining this and these data sources with focused injury and violence prevention programming is really what is key to lead more to more comprehensive and timely prevention and intervention of injuries and violence in Virginia, not just during the COVID-19 pandemic, but every single day. Next slide. 
these are just my contact information um, acknowledgements. I do want to acknowledge the team that helped me with these data and putting this together and then all the citations below. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was great. Um, I think the data you presented are incredibly striking. Um, and I know that I'm guilty of, of sometimes having a very narrow focus on what the impacts of COVID-19 are. And it serves as a good reminder that you know, injury and violence is also a, an impact of COVID, and especially during the lockdown. Um, and certainly a reminder for clinicians to be screening for these, um, you know, for intimate partner violence, probably child abuse as well, suicide mental health when they're having their visits with patients, whether those are virtual um, or in person. So thank you very much. I do have some questions, but I'm going to hold them until the very end, um, just to allow um, as much time as possible for our speakers. And then if, there, if time does allow, I'll ask them at that point. So if we could move on to the next slide. Um, so next we'll have Dr. May presenting on the impact of COVID-19 on frontline responders, um, talking about stress, depression, opioid use, and mental health disorders and resilience. So Dr. May, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, looks like the slides are just dialing up now. There we go. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be a part of this uh, conversation today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some uh, data that's actually been secured. Some of that's from previous studies. Um, and then some of the more recent data that's actually come out of China uh, and Singapore. Um, there's a previous literature on the impacts of large infectious disease outbreaks that we need to pay attention to. And those really were studies done during and, and shortly thereafter for SARS, MERS, and Ebola epidemics. Um, but it's important to note that uh, findings from both earlier studies and the more recent reports are neither unanimous nor mutually exclusive of each other. So anytime in the following slides where I think that there's been some uh, differences between the studies that are being reported here. I'll point those out. Um, I, like most Americans, have been watching and hearing about the impact of COVID upon healthcare workers anecdotally on the TV almost every night. Um, and I can certainly relate the phrase that you hear is uh, um, vicarious trauma, and that uh, some of us have experienced different levels of that watching those healthcare workers come out of the hospitals after eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 hour shifts, um, working full speed ahead and not feeling that they've necessarily gotten the desired results that they wanted to. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. I also check in on a couple local call lines that are available in the Richmond area for support. And I'll give you the hint ahead of time is that they've only begun to report very modest changes in either content or quantity of incoming calls for assistance. So I guess similar to the last speaker, I think some of these um, potential indicators, it's probably a little too early to tell at this point in time. Next slide, please. Um, there's just uh, three studies. I looked over a number of them, but these are ones that had a fairly robust uh, sampling size. Um, they were all uh, cross-sectional in nature, so it's not over time, which would of course be necessary to eventually identify what the long-term impacts psychologically are on healthcare frontline workers. Next slide, please. Uh, most commonly reported psychological impacts are stress or perceived stress. Anxiety, panic states and panic disorders, loneliness, depression, and suicide, increased substance use disorders. Now, I'm going to stop on that one just for a minute because that's really my field. But the, uh, as you just saw in the previous uh, present part of the presentation today, um, the indicators for this are not clear at this point in time. There's a lot of speculation that they're expecting to see. Uh, increase in substance use disorder, disorders, and there is some initial indication of overdose increases, and I'll talk about those later, but it, the data is not as clear, crystal clear as it can be. Um, also commonly reported are the stressors of prolonged exposure to ongoing stress, which can re, um, result in post-traumatic stress disorder over time. And then specifically in some of these studies, they looked at fear and the perception of of uh, trauma. Next slide. 
So tr most of the, I won't take a long time on these, but trauma is any event or series of events or circumstances which individual is perceiving as being physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and they ha have adverse effects over an extended period of time in somebody's life in different areas of functioning, mental, physical, emotional, social, and spiritual well-being. Um, there's a number of different ways that people experience trauma. It can be physical or sexual abuse, emotional abuse, bullying. Um, it can be the participation in military activities during war, uh, witnessing or experience violence, uh, forced displacement, and racism, which is currently the hot topic. Uh, besides COVID in our communities today. Um, and so, according to CDC, about 60% of adults have experienced some form of trauma over the course of their lives. And in one cross-sectional study back in 2016, 2016, excuse me, uh, almost 46% of people ages 17 and younger had experienced at least one traumatic event during that single year. Pre uh, next slide, please. Um, typically, we think about trauma as being experienced during war, genocides. Uh, now we hear a lot of conversations about the trauma experience with slavery and discrimination, systematic prejudice. Um, and over the last few years in other parts of the world, we've seen trauma experienced by large numbers of people due to for forced relocation and destruction of cultural practices. And not too far into our past, we've had history of uh, studying some of the impacts uh, of previous pandemics. In the current pandemics context for COVID-19, we know that trauma can be experienced from repeated exposure to suffering and death, fear of death or exposing loved ones to infection and death, having to work without the necessary supplies, exorbitant work hours and shifts, and a lack of sleep and sleep disorders. And those can be, but are not necessarily all related and a perceived lack of support or a lack of control over the outcomes in the work that one does. Next slide, please. So symptoms of P PTSD usually begin within three months of exposure to the trauma. Um, diagnostically, these symptoms need to last longer than one month and have to be severe enough to interfere with daily functioning um, and cannot be related just to medication, substance use, or other illness. Sometimes we can see people who have experienced trauma and experienced PTSD who will self-medicate, uh, particularly with illicit substances or overuse of prescribed medications, um, but those would be legitimate cases of PTSD that existed prior to those uh, drug use uh, issues. For a diagnosis specifically of PTSD, adults must have all the following for a month or more, uh, at least one re-experiencing symptom, one avoidance symptom, two arousal and reactivity symptoms, and at least two cognitive and or mood symptoms. Um, we have uh, in that pattern there, you see both approach and avoidance behaviors uh, that become activated when someone is suffering from PTSD. Uh, Re-experiencing symptoms, we generally hear about people having flashbacks, particularly those who have been in war zones. Um, they can be reoccurring memories or dreams about events that were stressful. Uh, they can be just repeated general distressing thoughts um, or other physical signs of, of stress as well. Uh, I just want to note here that while a lot of people are going to recovery or recover within six months of experiences, there is another group of people that uh, for whom symptoms are going to last a year or longer. Um, People with PTSD also have co-occurring conditions such as depression, substance use disorder, and one or more anxiety disorders. Next slide, please. So what makes the difference between the people who get it and keep it and the ones who get it and get over it? Um, risk factors that may increase the likelihood of developing PTSD uh, include exposure to dangerous events or traumas, specifically childhood trauma or getting hurt or seeing people hurt or killed, feeling horror, hopelessness, or extreme fear. Uh, and I would add to that over time, um, having little or no social support or feeling like one has no social support after the traumatic event or events have been experienced, as well as dealing with additional stressors that could occur after the original traumatic event. 
And finally, we know that personal and family histories of mental illness or substance use um, are both indicators of uh, higher risk uh, for PTSD down the road for individuals who suffer from, the, from those disorders. Resilience factors that can actually reduce the likelihood or may help us um, prepare ourselves better so that when we experience those traumatic events that we don't develop PTSD include having a coping strategy for getting through difficult times and difficult events and a capacity to be able to learn from the traumatic event itself. Um, recent literature has also talked about resilience, including being prepared, having a plan, being able to respond to upsetting events as they occur, in spite of those feelings of fear, anxiety, and depression in the midst of the trauma, having a plan to get out of it or get through it and to cope with it uh, is a resilience factor. Uh, another resilience uh, indicator is people are able to, who are able to seek out support from friends, family, or support groups. And I'll talk about the latter a little bit further in this presentation. And learning to feel okay with one's actions in response to a traumatic event. Um, there were some anecdotal reports reviewed for this presentation where uh, some nurses had been interviewed and they were specialists in one particular area, maybe obstetrics or mental health, uh, psychiatry, uh, nursing staff, and they talked about how inadequate they felt because that's not the type of work that they have been doing um, during the COVID crisis. These are nurses in China that um, uh, one of them even said that she felt ashamed because she hadn't brushed up on her nursing skills to be able to deal with working in the ICU or the COVID wards. Um, that's not a good indicator when they're verbalizing like that. A better indicator is when people learn to feel like they're okay with whatever actions you've taken to respond to an event. Next slide, please. So some of these studies from prior to COVID, um, you see slightly different mixes of who was studied, but they typically involve physicians and nurses from infectious disease, emergency medicine, uh, depending on what part of the world, special fever clinics and intensive care units, and additional uh, ancillary healthcare uh, providers, including technicians from radiology, the labs, and infection control in the hospitals. Um, the studies conducted during and immediately after severe uh, respiratory syndrome or SARS um, and MERS and Ebola outbreaks uh, all came to similar conclusions that medical staff are consistently experiencing prolonged stress during these epidemics. Some staff uh, will continue to suffer psychologically long after the initial outbreak is over. Um, a very common finding was that frontline healthcare workers had major concerns regarding viral transmission to their families. Depending on how old that were, they were, that might be more focused on their children. But for many, it also included um, uh, concern that they might transmit to living parents, particularly parents who had um, some pre-existing conditions. And interestingly, in several of these studies, there were gender differences noted with regard to ability to cope, such that women were found to be more likely than men to develop social and personal mechanisms for coping um, with epidemic-related stress. That may be reinforcing some long-held stereotypes about men like to be tough and do it by themselves, and women like to be more social, I'm not sure. But there were certainly uh, noted uh, differences in the studies prior to COVID for um, epidemics that involved respiratory uh, outbreaks uh, prior to this period we're in right now. Next slide, please. Um, the same studies had found that stress was greatest for emergency nurses, followed by the emergency physicians, and then the allied healthcare staff after that. Um, some of the most important variables that were found to be associated with experience of stress included a feeling of loss of control, as well as that vulnerability to infection I just mentioned. Uh, there's a phrase used, particularly in some of the nursing literature, about uh, psychic exhaustion. And this is the phrase that made me think about those people that we see coming out of the, the hospital at the end of a shift. And you can just see it on their faces. They feel like uh, it's all been for naught. They've worked as hard as they can. Um, they're totally exhausted physically. And 
you can see the emotions are just draining off of their face. Um, that's uh, what people I think are generally referring to as a state of psychic exhaustion. And another group of factors, of course, had fear about their personal health and fear about spreading the virus. Important strategies for coping with these um, for medical emergency staff were acceptance of the medical situation at hand and the use of the active use of coping strategies. So earlier I said you had to have a plan or it's good to have a plan, but then you have to actually use the plan that you've got in place if you're gonna actually cope successfully with the stress. Um, and then psychologically, people who are capable of reframing in a positive way or maintaining a positive outlook in spite of all that's going wrong at work, um, uh, have been found to be able to cope better over the long haul. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier that these epidemics have, in some instances, for some people, had a significant impact on their well being uh, psychologically over time. Next slide, please. So, in China, there were two particular studies I tuned into that have uh, large ends. Uh, both of these were single center, single hospital cross sectional survey. So they don't involve following people over time as of yet, but I suspect those same researchers are doing that while we speak. Um, they mostly use standardized rating scales, some fear scales uh, that were numerical, but also the Hamilton anxiety scale and the Hamilton depression scale. And then a number of follow up questions trying to get at some personal issues and factors that may be related to those primary measures. Some of the findings from those studies, uh, severity of negative symptoms, including fear, anxiety, and depression, differed significantly between medical and non-medical staff, with those non-medical staff being potentially the administrative staff, um, clerical staff that were not on the wards, et cetera. Frontline medical staff um, who had the close contact with the infected patients working in what I call the high exposure clinics and wards including the ICU were the ones showing the higher levels of fear, anxiety, and depression on the standardized instruments. Next slide. Other findings, uh, frontline medical staff were estimated to have 1.4 times, uh, um, they were more 1.4 times more likely to feel and experience fear, uh, twice as likely to suffer anxiety and depression as, as the non-medical staff in the same facility. Medical staff, particularly those working in those high exposure departments, were assessed as being more susceptible uh, to psychological disorders as a function of their day to day work. Um, COVID 19 epidemic resulted in an increased workload for the medical staff. I think we've seen that play out daily um, on our TVs. Primary factors associated with stress or mitigation of the stress include personal and uh, familial risk of infection. Action, actual patient mortality, uh, availability of clear infection control guidance. Next slide, please. Also, uh, other factors, the availability of effective protective equipment. I think for two months at least, we kept to watch all of these poor hospital workers coming out and complaining that they didn't have the equipment that they needed all over the country. Recognition of the work of hospital staff by administrators and leadership was found to be actually a positive um, mechanism for ameliorating some of the stress that was being experienced. Decreases in the number of cases in their communities and institutions. So if you saw your numbers going down, like we saw uh, in the opening slides here today, um, that tended to give people a better feeling and some somewhat reduced levels of stress. Uh, medical staff expected to have recognition from higher level healthcare authorities. Um, doesn't say whether they always felt they got it. Um, and some of the most important factors that kept people going um, were perceived social and moral responsibilities and professional obligations. And then um, there were some slight differences by age about exactly what they were concerned about. But for the people in the, in the 30s, basically 31 to 40, um, their most, most of their stress was attributable concern to concern about the transmission to their families and children and parents. Next slide, please. Um, increasing awareness of the COVID mortality rate was a cause of stress. Working in an isolation ward increased stress. Shortages of protective equipment um, and feeling not satisfied over the results that were being obtained at work were all stressful. 
being concerned that the epidemic would never be controlled. Um, I'm not sure about you. I'm hearing some of those statements like that in other um, settings that I'm in. Uh, feeling lonely and being isolated from loved ones is traumatically stressful. And seeing colleagues showing signs of stress was a source of stress itself. And this is vicarious trauma we talked about. So if you see one of your colleagues at work starting to fall apart, that has a major impact on you while you're trying to do your job in the midst of this um, terrible uh, epidemic. And at least for the Chinese staff, compared to some previous studies that have been out, done in Western countries, Chinese medical staff were less likely to seek psychological help or express their emotions compared to medical staff in Western countries. Next slide, please. Uh, so what were the recommendations out of the Chinese studies? Visible support is critically important for the staff who work there, provision of both facilities and equipment that are adequate to the task by hospital leadership and the government are necessary elements for these hospitals to be able to retain their staff to encourage them to persevere even under stress and to mitigate against the negative that uh, psychological sequelae that are expected in these circumstances and to increase the likelihood that they will remain involved in future epidemics. And I think many of us recognize this is uh, with the SARS and the MERS and Ebola and now COVID, um, there's really a never ending number of possibilities for future epidemics um, in the years to come. Next slide, please. So uh, one particular uh, study coming out of Singa Singapore also looked at the uh, psychological uh, stress on healthcare workers and again compared the, those who are medically trained to those who are not medically trained. The, this was done across two hospitals, so a little bit bigger um, sampling than had been done in the Chinese studies. Um, they also used standardized questionnaires and structured interviews. Um, Healthcare workers tended to be, in their eyes, the medically trained or physicians and nurses and non-medical. Uh, they consider just about anybody else, allied health professionals, pharmacists, technicians, administrators, et cetera. Primary outcomes were prevalence of depression, stress, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder among the workers. And then secondary outcomes involve comparing the prevalence of those disorders and the mean um, scores on some of the um, standardized instruments between the different uh, types of training among the healthcare workers. Next slide, please. What did they find? 68 of the participants, 14.5% screened positive for anxiety disorders. 42 or just about 9% uh, screened positive for depression. Uh, 31, 6.6% for stress and 36, 7.7 for clinical concern of PTSD. What I wanna say about that, except for that last bullet, none of those first three are necessarily um, inconsistent with what you might find in the general population during a non-COVID situation. Um, so none of those are blockbusters in themselves, but having 7.7% .7 of any pop percent of any population um, showing signs of clinical PTSD is of concern. Anxiety pre prevalence was higher in non-medical healthcare workers than in medical personnel after various adjustments were for other confounding factors had been made. And they had also, the non-hospital workers obtained higher deaths in anxiety and stress subsale scores um, in the non-medical health workers as well. Next slide, please. So those differences they found between the medically trained and non-medically trained were counterintuitive compared to some previous studies that had been done. And the authors of these studies were speculating, this study was, were speculating that, um, particularly in Singapore, particularly because of the work that had been done to prepare hospitals and hospital staff and the medical staff in particular, how to deal with um, these uh, respiratory viral outbreaks that came out of the previous SARS outbreak um, led to better infection control measures and more training and better preparedness for those staff. So they think that they just felt more experienced and um, better trained to cope with the situation this time. The finding that non-medically trained healthcare workers had higher anxiety prevalence um, 
was somewhat similar to another recent COVID study that frontline nurses had shown significantly lower vicarious traumatization scores than had other nurses in general public. And again, the authors on that had um, suggested that may be due to access to support for them, access to better current medical information, and possibly more training for the nurses and less for the other um, healthcare workers. Next slide, please. So I check in on two local call-in lines. These are warm support lines, tend to be run by what we call peers, people with lived experience. A live RVA, which is a little more addiction focused and Mental Health America call-in line, which is a little more mental health focused. Initial data from them are modest at best. At best, both tend to call, uh, get their callers from primarily from people who are looking for help with ongoing substance use or mental health disorders. Um, but we see just a slight increase in the number of calls with existing panic disorders or anxiety disorders who are now experiencing exacerbations of those symptoms due to COVID concerns. Uh, callers on both lines had reported a number of them feeling stir crazy and isolated and complained about being unable to attend their normal support activities such as AA or NA or other type of groups that they participated in to stay healthy. Uh, again, these are individuals who also express fears of having COVID or concerns about the health of their elderly parents. And people with addictive disorders, I uh, just got a, a text literally before this presentation started. They dug a little deeper into the data from the Alive RVA. And what they had shown was the slight increase in March, uh, excuse me, in April. Uh, but then a decrease again in May of people that were actually raising COVID-related concerns on those call for help lines. So again, it's very premature at this point in time, but not, not what I would call blockbuster findings in terms of the number of calls going into these uh, warm lines or support lines related to COVID. Next slide, please. Uh, recently, verbal reports in the Richmond Police Department suggest, and this is probably uh, validated somewhat by the previous presenter. Um, based on non-toxicology confirmed reports, RPD has already responded three times as many, to three times as many um, fatal overdoses year to date. So we're not quite halfway through the year in 2020 than they responded to at the same time last year. And if you play that out, they've also, they've seen more fatal overdoses so far this year than we're seeing in all of 2019. Uh, we typically like to surround those data with other measures, other indicators around the system. One of those being what, what does our intake for treatment look like at Richmond Behavioral Health Authority. Unfortunately, right now we are artificially suppressed because everything uh, for intake is being done through telehealth delivery only. And so we're only able to take X number of people per day but we've had continuously high demands for both mental health and substance use disorder services since March. So we certainly seen it, have not seen any backing off of the demand for those services. Um, and slightly increased calls from people with either mental health symptoms or substance use disorder uh, who are interested. So this is prior to actually making an intake appointment, but they, they wanna call and talk about it with somebody before they've actually jumped in and made the make the uh, commitment to change. Next slide. So we serve a lot of people on an annual basis and we have a lot of staff working in those positions. Uh, we feel pretty fortunate at this point. We've only had 30 plus cases uh, total across both staff and consumers over the last three months. And we've made a number of delivery adjustments due to COVID-19. And I'll just summarize this to say that basically most of the outpatient services we deliver, including outpatient OBOT services for people with substance use, particularly opioid use disorders, uh, we're continuing to deliver those ongoing basis, Tuesday through Friday, all through telehealth. Um, and we have not seen any drop off of participation in those. In fact, we are actually seeing increases in the number of people who are staying committed to their treatment and are returning for treatment. Next slide. Um, I, again, I won't hang out here. This is repeating what I just said. We're doing a lot of uh, appointment-based telehealth assessments and service delivery. Uh, DoxyMe tends to be our main 
uh, linkage for delivering the telehealth services. And for people that we serve who don't have uh, smartphones and computers, we've set up um, private kiosks down in the lobby of our main building that are already wired for direct linkage via DoxyMe to the nurse and the prescribers uh, or one of the behavioral health clinicians and that we man that lobby with a nurse and a receptionist who are able to set up people who walk in to c conduct those appointments uh, with their prescribers um, in the lobby. Next slide, please. Obviously, the things that we have not been able to deliver through telehealth at this point are prescription pickups, urine drug screens, and patient injections. Um, so we do have a number of patients still coming by to receive injections, either for their medication-assisted treatment for addictions or long-acting injectables for antipsychotics. Um, and unless we feel like we absolutely have to have a urine screen for diagnostic purposes, we have backed off of taking urine screens uh, during the COVID situation to protect both the staff and the clients. Next slide, please. Um, we're seeing more clients, I just said this, in both primary care and the OBOTS program via telehealth. Uh, we had a little bumpy ride when we first made the transition, but one of the more positive outcomes is we actually have had reduced no-show rates uh, over this three-month period, and it seems to be getting better by the week. Um, and when we looked at the data for service delivery for both uh, behavioral health clinicians and case managers, they seem to be making more number of contacts with the consumers that we serve, but they're doing it for shorter periods of time. So maybe people just don't like to hang out on the phone longer than they have to. Next slide. Um, so just to summarize, you can really experience trauma in any kind of a work environment um, and grief counseling to be made available and training employees ahead of time about what the expected traumas they might experience can help reduce um, the traumatic experience of the workplace and the severity and longevity of those symptoms after the crisis is over. Um, staff tend to be reassured when there are clear disease prevention guidelines, including hand washing and the use of masks and PPE. Um, Psychological stress does accumulate over time, however, and the studies that have been um, published to date obviously have not had the advantage of studying uh, stress related to COVID over a longer period of time, and I would expect to see those studies at three, six, and 12-month points over the coming year. Um, and all of these things listed in this last bullet here, the number of confirmed and suspected cases, the overwhelming workloads, unreliable supplies of PPE, extensive media coverage on all of the above, and the lack of any curative medications and low levels of perceived support all contribute to the mental health burden of healthcare professionals. Next slide. Um, COVID-19, like previous uh, uh, outbreaks, has been associated with anxiety, including depression, ongoing trauma, and as the previous presenter noted, we don't know quite yet about the suicide impact, but we expect we will see that um, in, in, in studied ways and not just beyond the anecdotal reports that you get on TV or the newspaper. Um, healthcare workers should be considered a highly vulnerable population for uh, both for contracting COVID, but also for suffering from the psychological impacts of treating the COVID virus. It's a little bit hard to assess the American health profession, how American uh, healthcare professionals emotionally, because the data has not really been published yet. There's some sources we're expecting to hear from that we haven't yet, uh, but that should be coming out over time. And one thing I want to point out, because we have this at our work workplace as well, uh, many people are experiencing this conflict between their work and their family roles. If you're a healthcare provider, responsibility uh, in your house for taking care of elderly parents and your children or your children when you had to do that during this outbreak and then suddenly they closed down the schools now you have an additional stressor added to the environment um, and that would be particularly so if you were taking care of elderly parents who had other chronic diseases prior to the COVID outbreak uh, next slide please so that wraps up what i wanted to cover i hope i've informed some of you and i'll be available here for questions as they might come up thank you Thank you so much, Dr. May. That was great. Um, I think, you know, as clinicians, we all feel and know that there are 
some stressors out there, but it's good to see the data that comes from, mm -hmm. you know, China and Singapore that kind of put some initial numbers at least mm -hmm. um, to that data. And um, similar to Lauren, I have questions for you as well, but I am conscious that we are actually at time and we still need um, Dr. Decker to go through her case presentations. Okay. So I think what I'll do is I will um, compile my questions as well as questions from anybody who's on the line right now and perhaps send them to you and Lauren for your input on them. And then we can email that to the, to the people who watch this a little bit later, if that's okay. Um, but I do really appreciate that presentation. Um, we did not have any questions submitted beforehand, um, but people who watch this recorded presentation later do have the ability to email us any questions they have after watching the presentation. So we'll compile those as well. Now, I did just want to check in with you, Dr. Decker. Um, given that we are over time, are, are you okay continuing your presentation or do you need to go? I just wanted to check. There we go. Um, so I'm, I'm you have, Okay, perfect. Um, so we will switch over to your presentation and Dr. Decker is going to walk us through a few case, case examples and how we would address mental health disorders, both through telehealth and in general. And I really appreciate it, Dr. Decker. Thank you so much. Sure. Next slide, please. So um, one of the common issues that comes up is trying to do appointments by telehealth. Certain things are more difficult to assess than usual. So I decided to focus on the single most common complaint that uh, pr primary care providers see and psychiatrists as well, which is depression. And so I wanted to talk briefly about depression assessment during a telehealth appointment and some of its implications. Um, I'm going to advocate here for having patients fill out a PHQ-9 prior to a telehealth visit. You can send them a copy via email, and um, PHQ-9, hopefully you know about, but if not, uh, I have a copy towards the end of the presentation and a link, too. Um, so what you're going to do during a telehealth appointment is to look at their answers and ask them about it. And keep in mind, please, that males, uh, sorry, this is not meant to be sexist, but they do tend to underreport symptoms of depression, and they often do not disclose suicidal ideation even when they have it. The most important thing, aside from discussing these topics, is to have a plan ahead of time for what you do if they voice suicidal ideation during the call. If, they're, if you're in a clinic setting, it's much easier to call, text, email the staff, but of course, nowadays we're doing a lot of telehealth direct to patient homes and HIPAA has been accepted to allow that process. But you have to keep in mind, there may be family members straying into the field of view and there may not be anybody present. So one way to do that is to um, ask the patient at the beginning of the call for an emergency contact person and phone number in case you get off, um, get cut off. That allows you to call back someone else if they actually voice suicidal ideation. Also, it's very important to have the suicide hotline number ready, and I've posted it here, and send it along with the PHQ-9 so that anytime they're thinking about it, they already have that. Next slide, please. So a couple of social communication reminders that are particularly important in psychiatry. Um, Less is more, obviously, uh, I love my dog, but we don't want him in the field of view when I'm talking with the patient about depression and suicide. Um, and the amount of information, people sometimes are more distracted when doing telehealth. Uh, they're mousing over things on their computer. So try to keep the information a little bit shorter and a little bit more to the point than you would in person. Um, also, I, I happen to be wearing stripes, so this is a good example of what not to do. Um, the idea is a white and black stripe is visually distracting. And um, apparently, using more gestures is better during telehealth. I don't find that I do that, um, but uh, the idea is that it is helpful at, sometimes. And if you're seeing patients who are different ages, for example, kids, you might want to have a toy visible. Um, actually, I'm going to hold up a spool of thread. But if I had a kid, I might have a toy in the background. And if it's an older adult, you have to make sure that they can hear properly. The most important thing in terms of social communication is to look at the patient very carefully 
during uh, the talking that you're doing with them because lack of eye contact, uncomfortable shifting, crying or you know things like that, um, those kinds of indicators can be extremely important. And in, if you were in person, you'd be subconsciously noticing them, but you have to consciously notice them during telehealth. Next, please. So I'm going to present a, a quick scenario and then two possible different kinds of patient responses to the exact same set of issues. So the, this is a 66 year old male. The ethnicity does not matter. Um, he has COPD, he's diabetic, he has type one and he has hypertension. So pretty typical, slightly older male who's already hit the high risk group for COVID-19. He scheduled an appointment because his blood sugars have been elevated recently. And you asked him to fill out a PHQ-9 prior to the appointment. And his score was 12. And I'm not going to go into great details about this, but 12 is in the moderately depressed zone. So first, you discuss his blood sugar and some of the interventions that you're going to do to get that down. Um, of course, the obvious things like losing weight and watching his diet, maybe adjusting the meds. And then you have noticed this 12 and you think about the fact that this is a male and that we've got a lot of stressors as Dr. May and um, uh, Lauren discussed earlier. And you say, you know, I noticed a couple of things on this form that you filled. I'd like to discuss that with you too briefly. Next slide, please. So when you ask about his attention, his answers, I'd like you to pay particular attentions to questions number six and nine. So question number six on the PHQ-9 relates to feeling badly about yourself or feeling of, like a failure. The reason for this is that feelings of failure are often associated with suicide attempts and or completion. And question nine is an overt question, which relates to feeling if you'd be better off dead or hurting yourself. And providers need to understand one thing right here uh, that I've always disliked about the way this question is worded. People that are intending to commit suicide do not usually think of suicide as hurting themselves. They see it as a solution to ending their pain and problems, and they don't see it as hurting themselves. They see it as ending the hurt that they're already feeling. So instead of focusing on this kind of judgmental, are you going to hurt yourself? your discussions should focus on their preoccupation with death. So let's see the next slide and have some sample discussions with the patient. So sample ways to explore the concept of failure, and this can all be done very quickly. Um, this only takes a, a couple of minutes. You can say, well, I noticed on this question that you said you've been feeling like you failed several times a, a week. Um, in what way do you feel you failed? And then they're likely to give you something about, well, I'm not making as much money or I'm not good at this or that. So you can then quickly say, well, what about some of your accomplishments? If this is a patient you know, you, you can name something that you know that they've already done, which is not part of what they've identified as a failure. So for example, if he feels he failed at work, ask about how great a father he is. If you know he likes to fish, you can say, well, you know, I, I remember you're, you're amazingly good at catching fish. And the corollary to this is, if they keep repeating, oh, I failed at everything. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just not good at anything at all. And you notice I didn't make eye contact there. They're in trouble. Uh, people that feel like they have no strengths are um, in serious trouble. And think about referral to a psychiatrist. You can also ask about hope. If they, have, if they feel like they're a failure, but they have some hope that they're gonna succeed at something in the future, that's okay. But if they say, you know, I've just lost whatever I was good at and I'm, I'm never gonna be able to do anything good again, again, that's a worrisome sign. Next slide, please. Um, on suicide, you can start that discussion by saying, I see you've marked on the PHQ-9 that you've been thinking about death. Here's an open-ended question, non-judgmental and very probing. Tell me more about your thoughts. So you're not, you're not getting into any sort of a judgment. You're inviting a discussion here. And they may say, well, I don't know, you know, Doc, I've, just, I've been thinking about death lately. Well, really good question to ask is whose death were you thinking about and why? 
And the reason is because many studies on suicide have shown that individuals who are considering suicide first think about death in an abstract concept, you know, the global idea of death, then they begin to be preoccupied with other people's death, and then they think about their own specifically. So especially now with COVID-19, people may move from the sense of loss for a particular person to, well, you know, life isn't really that great now, everything's going to ha um, heck in the handbasket, and I might as well not be here. And then the most important thing about discussing suicide with somebody is if you feel shocked or sound shocked or horrified by the word <laughs> suicide, they'll know that you're uncomfortable and the patient will shut down any discussion of their feelings. Practice saying it until you can say the word suicide as matter of factly as gallbladder, prostate, or myocardial infarction. Next slide, please. So, okay, here's patient A. You ask these questions, and this patient, again, he's a 66-year-old male with diabetes, hypertension, and COPD, therefore he's at risk of getting COVID. He says, I feel like a failure because my small business has lost 35% of its income, and the PPP, uh, that's the administration support loan, isn't enough to keep going for more than an another month, I've got my employees and my family to take care of, and I'm at my wit's end. Um, it, the response that you make as a provider is to discuss treatments for COVID-19, remdesivir, dexamethasone, and vaccines. We have at least 137 under development. There are 300 clinical trials. There are American companies with vaccine delivery estimated optimistically in September of 2020 and more realistically for January, February, 2021. Now, this patient, patient A says, wow, doc, that's better. I feel much better already. I still don't know how I'll make the finances work, but I guess I can handle another few months. I just heard all this stuff in the media about two years of COVID-19 and I was just so worried. And he makes good eye, eye contact and he smiles at you. So the fact that the patient expressed hope in response to this reassurance is a very good sign. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're gonna get patient B with the same clinical characteristics, the 66-year-old male with uh, COPD, hypertension, diabetes, and a PHQ 12, 9 of 12, also moderately depressed according to the numbers, but this is a different person. He says, I feel like a failure, same words, because my small business has lost 35% of its income. The PPP loan isn't gonna keep us going for more than another month. I've got employees and a family to take care of and I'm at my wit's end. So your response is the same, I won't reread it. And the patient says, I can't make it that long and I just don't believe that those scientists will be on schedule. I can't do this anymore. <sighs> Big sigh. Well, th these are all bad signs. You need to refer the patient to a psychiatrist. You need to think about emergency response measures. You might even say, well, um, this it might be the point where you say, well, are you thinking about ending it right now? Are you thinking about suicide right now? And you can also ask the patient, if you can talk with a family member and have them, and then if they say yes, you can have them watch the patient for any further sign of hopelessness or instant excessive cheerfulness. Remind both the patient and the family member of the suicide hotline number and that they can always 24 7, 365, reach somebody to talk to. Why is the excessive cheerfulness in here? Because frequently people who are just about to commit suicide become very cheerful immediately prior to it. Why? Because they think that their problems are all about to be solved by suicide, so they're no longer discouraged. It's very misleading, and sometimes both family and providers miss it. Next, please. Um, so I'm not gonna go through this, or I, I guess I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly. So response to question number nine, the question on PHQ-9 about suicide, does that answer predict suicide? And the answer is a resounding yes and no at the same time. Uh, there are two really big studies, which is very nice. One was done a while ago in 2013 by a civilian um, group health cooperative, which is a, a large HMO on the West Coast. 
And 13% of patients in that study who reported thoughts of death or self-harm more than half the days of a week or nearly every day, 13, that 13% accounted for 53% of suicides and 54% of suicide deaths. So that yes on that question did mean something, but 70% of patients who said they weren't thinking of suicide at all during the week accounted for 22% of suicide attempts and 24% of suicide deaths. So in other words, quite a few people denied having any suicidal ideation, but they were planning to do it. So even though um, you get a positive answer on question nine, that's important to discuss. The fact of the matter is that quite often a negative answer doesn't mean that you're safe or they're safe. Um, this is fairly similar to the VA study, which is more recent, 2018. I mean, Veterans Affairs, of course. And it had a huge N, half a million. And they found that a response of feeling suicidal several days a week on, on, um, was associated with a 75% increased risk of suicide. And a response of more than half the days was associated with a 115% increased risk of suicide and a response of nearly every day was associated with 185% increased risk of suicide. However, again, 71, two thirds, over two thirds of suicides during that study period also occurred in people who said not at all. So then both in civilians and in our veterans, people who are about to commit suicide often don't say anything about it on this item nine. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to refresh your memory here. Uh, so this is the PHQ-2. Um, PHQ-2 contains the first two questions from PHQ-9. And the reason that um, this is included in my presentation is that the PHQ-2 as a depression screen um, has been found to be almost as useful as a PHQ-9. But you'll notice that um, it doesn't really ask anything about suicide and it doesn't ask about feelings of failure. And those two concepts are quite important to, um, for the clinician to assess when assessing suicide risk. So this is a great brief questionnaire, but it really doesn't hit all the bases. Next slide, please. So this is the PHQ-9. This is all in the handout that you will be able to see later on. And again, you'll see that A and B here um, on this particular version, they use letters. That's the PHQ-2, questions one and two. And then F, which is question six, feeling badly about yourself or that you're a failure. And I, thoughts that you would be better off dead or hurting yourself in some way. Uh, those are on it. And then there's also um, on this version, um, how, how difficult have these problems been making your life lately? Uh, next, quest, next slide, please. Okay, so I have two sets of selected references. Um, the, there are two um, electronic links at the bottom. These are recent uh, references where uh, comparison of different methods of screening for depression in family practice have been um, reported by people. And the la next slide, please, shows these are some of the landmark studies in the development of PHQ-9 and its use in primary care um, for depression screening. Next slide, please. And I moved with lightning speed through all of that, and I'll be happy to answer questions through whatever mechanism we end up using but uh, thank you for asking me to help out. Thank you so much, Dr. Decker. Um, and you actually answered some of my questions that I had from some of the previous, previous presentations, so that was great. Um, and I do think, just in the interest of wrapping this up for those who are watching the recording, um, that I will send any further questions to you by email rather than covering them during the session right now. And so for those individuals who are watching this recording, after reviewing these presentations, if you have additional questions that you would like to direct to our speakers, please email us. You can see the email address here on the screen, ivp at vdh.virginia.gov. And we will um, compile those questions and have them answered and then sent back to all participants. 
I know that for the last two recordings, we have not had very many questions, but I do encourage you, please email us those questions. We are very happy to answer them and send them out to you. This slide just reviews our, some key resources that you might find useful. I'm not gonna review them right now, um, but you do have them in the slides. Next slide, please. And then just a reminder that next week, on July 2nd, we will be recording our session from 12 to 1. It will be available immediately thereafter. And it's gonna be discussing older adults in COVID-19. So we initially had this included in our special population session, but we felt like it deserved its own hour long session. Um, and that is our last scheduled session. There may be additional ones after that, but for the moment, that is the last session in this Project Echo. Um, if you'd like to register for that session on July 2nd, you can see the link here. You can go ahead and register to watch it. Um, and again, I just wanted to thank all three of our speakers. Thank you, Lauren, Dr. May, and Dr. Decker. I don't know about others, but I found this very fascinating and very informative, especially um, you know, COVID is, is affecting all of us and it's good to see some data rather than just to kind of see what you see on TV. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, again, I apologize for going over time and we will be reaching out to all of you after this with some questions. So thank you very much. Thank you.